Hello, Sermon Brainwave listeners and viewers. This is Matt Skinner. I'm inviting you to join Caroline, Joy, and me at Ghost Ranch in New Mexico from July 29 through August 2, 2024. Just visit Working Preachers homepage, click on the link under Preachers Retreat, and you can register. Space is limited, so sign up today. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. We are in the on the fourth Sunday in Lent, and that falls on March 10, 2024. The texts are Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. Our psalm is 107, verses 1 through 3, and then 17 through 22. The second reading is Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And our gospel reading is John 3, 14 through 21, which I have referenced a lot already in our podcast. Have, from Have we ever, do, do we know any of those verses? Yes, we might have heard of a few. Do you have any strong opinions? I, That's yes, I'm just going to, I'm not even going to go, I'm not even going to pretend that I don't. I have all That's kinds good. of Joy's voice is still failing, and I'm still freaked out by numbers 21. So you you go. Take oh it. well, I yeah, John numbers 21. I, that totally freaks me out too. I mean, because uh, yeah, the whole line of then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among people, and they bit the people, and then they died. That's just yeah. Don't know quite what to do with that. I'm hoping you have answers to that. But nonetheless, obviously it's, it's chosen. <laughs> Thanks. What? <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. Obviously it's chosen to go with uh, the reference <laughs> in John 3.14. But John 3.14, one thing that we want to pay attention to, I think first, is that this is the first of three references to Jesus being lifted up. And one could say it's uh, it's John's equivalent of the passion predictions, the passion resurrection predictions, but they're actually passion resurrection ascension predictions because John, to be for Jesus to be lifted up is the cross and the resurrection and the ascension. And so that is the first homiletical thought or idea or import importance is to recognize that 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 for Jesus to be lifted up is all three in uh in John's in John's Christology and in John's theology and that the entirety of Jesus ministry and the in in being the incarnation of the word, that the fullness of that does not reach its full its fullness until the ascension, which is promised throughout the gospel. And so, uh, and I think that's important too, because I think frequently John 3, 14, the interpretation of that gets isolated to the cross and that's not correct for John. And so again, it's going back to, a theme that we've been talking about, or I've been talking about for this Lent of holding, right, the the cross and the resurrection, and here for John, the ascension, holding them in tension or holding them together, that this is not, and you get this in John, that this is not a linear life. This is not a linear reality of moving through cross, resurrection, ascension. They're for John, they, all of that is sort of atemporal <laughs> and, uh, and is part of the overall promise of this gospel to bring all people to myself, right? Uh, to, so that all people might know God's love, be loved by God, so that all people might be in this abiding, re- intimate relationship with God. And, uh, and that whoever believes, all of those who believe, will have this eternal life which is here and now and and uh and if you're looking for a definition of eternal life here it is here it is john 17 3. there it is there it is and this is eternal life that they may know you jesus is talking to god and know me that's it that's eternal life 
So eternal life is becomes that 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 promise, right? Of of really the fourfold reality of Jesus, um, of of John's Christology, incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. And I should say that too, that the third reference to I I I will lift all people to myself is in our fifth Sunday of Lent. So we'll we will be revisiting this in John 12. And then the second one is John 8, 28. And uh and that is a, an important corrective to to John 314 as well, because in 828, Jesus says, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will realize that I am, right? It's one of the absolute I ams. So that you realize who, who this God is um, in Jesus and this God who loves the world in John 316. Okay. Those are some first some some initial some first some, some initial, first, thoughts. Some initial. <laughs> that's level 1 level 1 <laughs> i only have 17 levels no i can't <laughs> we got a bit to go then <laughs> anyway well, that's what i was going to say i knew it <laughs> i've been listening to you so that was what i was going to say i I have no more, no, I no longer have original thoughts about John. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, everything I say about John is like, I think Caroline Lewis said that. <laughs> I would want to add one thing to your fourfold, whatever, mm. your fourfold yep. experience of Jesus, the giving of the spirit. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Maybe that's in there. Or maybe that's because I spent all my time in Acts, which also has an ascension. But yeah. Um, so I guess, I mean, we've, we've solved John's mysteries in these, in this first seven minutes of the podcast. Yeah. So where do we go with preaching this? Mm -hmm. Um, so we're not just explaining, mm -hmm. um, in our sermons, especially a passage that people might know or recognize, and you've helped us see new things in that, uh, especially the idea of being lifted up. I think might be useful in Lent, which tends to be a season of contemplation and a sense of seriousness and gravity. Mm -hmm. And for me, the things that you named about being lifted up, those are, um, well, it's also, he'll also use language of glorification in other places. Right. Right. Am I said fair? Am I making that connection? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, which is a happier word for me than we, we don't often talk about glory during Lent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's part of the upside downness, right? Of of crucifixion as something that's meant to utterly degrade a human being and dehumanize them. Yet Jesus says, at this moment, you're going to recognize something. You're going to be able to glimpse something about who I am, which, which again is so inverted in terms of what anybody would expect not just in the Roman world, but in our own. So, so where does that take us? Is it just like, be ready to be surprised? Is it, is it back to last week's language of, of power being manifested in weakness? It's a different author, I realize. Yeah, it's a you different know, author. Oh, go ahead, Joy. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no I, I, I may be taking it in a different direction. So circle back. Um, but um, yeah, Caroline, as you know, I love John 17, 3. And this, uh, as you know, Jesus being over her, talking to the Father, saying, "This is life eternal." And if the, to know God is eternal life, then this is a text of knowing God. What do we know about God? We know that God loved the world, and that everything that God did in the promises in the covenants were evidence to all the world. All the blessings to some were for the many. The calling of one was for all. And God sent his son so that folks would know God loves us. And, and also, equally important, 
maybe more important because we right now we really need to be loved. Um, we really need to belong. But we also need not to be condemned. And too often, God is used as, you know, the one through which we can condemn others, the one through which we can say you don't belong. And I think when we read this text, it's not John 3.16, it's John 3.16.17. Because they weren't written in verses. There were complete thoughts, and the complete thought of knowing this God is God's love through made evident through Jesus is for the world because God didn't come to that because Jesus didn't come to condemn, but the world that the world might find wholeness, healing, healing, satisfaction, and belonging. Well, and I think uh, I think Joy, that's a really helpful those last few words that you said is a really helpful way to think about particularly John as you were talking about John 3:17 but in order that the world might be saved through him and saved. salvation uh and and you know you were talking about Matt how what difference does this make for preaching uh the 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 lifting up having that wider perspective of what that means then also problematizes <laughs> or invites talking about salvation and what that yes. means and what that looks like and for this gospel the salva- the this salvation is this is the eternal life it's the knowing it's the relationship and so salvation is uh is 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 not just located on the cross it is the the resurrection which is then leads the ascension and i'm 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 preparing a, an abiding place for you and so it's it is belonging it's relationship it's uh it's being a part of the flock it's it that's what it is and so that in john 4 42 when the samaritans say truly is the savior of the world that's what they mean yeah uh they mean that that salvation is in eternal life is in this knowing in being in relationship with with this in intimacy of belonging and because Jesus hasn't done anything yet except for <laughs> turn water into wine that's it <laughs> so uh and but i think also you were talking about this matt in terms of the, of lent of lent in term in like the you know kind of the seriousness of lent and the cause for discernment that's where John 3.19 is so important. And this is the judgment. It's actually, this is the crisis. So, you know, condemnation, judgment, it's all the same word, crisis. This is the crisis. This is the moment of discernment. This is the moment right. of decision. That the light has come into the world and we choose light. We choose the darkness rather than the light. And so, mm-hmm. and so that's the... Jesus doesn't judge. Jesus doesn't condemn. We condemn and judge ourselves by what our response is going to be to this love. What is our response going to be to this God loving the world? Uh, what is our response going to be when God reveals God's self in the flesh? Uh, and that's on us. <laughs> that is on us. What will we see? Um, and and so will we choose? Will we choose the light, um, or will we choose? not to be in that relationship with Jesus. That's all super good for preaching. I'm really elegant. I wonder, uh, can we go out of sequence and jump to Ephesians 2? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm not just. Thinking? I'm not just trying to put the serpents aside, but that's... I'm fine, um, to, I'm fine to put the serpents well, aside. <laughs> Ephesians. Yeah, because I'm trying to figure out how to know this God. Hmm. Right. I also want to know how to avi- how to survive a snake bite, but that's a different kind of podcast, probably. <laughs> I'm sure there's one out there that people can direct me to. But, you know, because okay. Ephesians 2 begins with, you know, when you were dead or though you were dead, like John 3, right, that shall not perish. But then, and again, I think the, I think the theological imagination of Ephesians is very different from John's, but 
still this idea of salvation is already underway, our experience of knowing, to borrow John's language, mm. both the Father and the Son is uh, is is in process. So verse six there about being already raised up with Christ mm -hmm. and being seated with Christ in heavenly places. Mm -hmm. um, Ephesians is not a book that says, hold on and wait for Jesus to come again. Ephesians is a no. book that says, live as though you are already because you already have been ascended with Christ, glorified with Christ, which is uh, easy to say, harder to live out or harder to imagine what that looks like. But this idea of accessibility is the wrong word, the availability of salvation and not just knowing you are quote unquote saved, but now this new kind of existence, this new kind of intimacy being available right now. I don't know. That's what I would do. I would find a way to kind of creatively talk about two books that have very different eschatologies than what we're and often yet, used to in, in yes in a in a christianity that's often defined by waiting mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i like that yeah and i think i i was doing a workshop with a group of pastors shout out to the pastors in southwest minnesota synod and we were talking one question was when we were talking about these texts and one of the pastors asked why don't we ever talk about the ascension <laughs> <laughs> we have a, we have ascension, you know, the the celebration of the ascension, but we don't we, often we don't have services because it's you know it's not it doesn't fall on a Sunday and such. And why don't we ever talk about the ascension or the fact that the ascension, our imagination of the ascension, is located in and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and we get kind of that glorification or that that kind of high Christology here in in uh, in Ephesians. Uh, but but that might be another. I say that in in what you were talking about, Matt. That might be another homiletical direction is to help people think about. Uh, well, at least for John, for sure. But also in our imagination and our theological imagination, that even the resurrection is not the last <laughs> promise of right. of what God is up to in Jesus it's the what difference does the ascension mean and and for ephesians it's that it's it's uh, it's that location of Jesus that uh that kind of works you know that works backward in terms of that constantly you know that reality of being saved for john it's this uh John, Jesus is preparing this place, right? This abiding place for us. And so, so that we know that that relationship with Jesus, with God will never be uh, severed. And so I, that might be something else to, uh, to, for, that might be very, very appealing for preachers to say, yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to talk about we're in Lent and we're talking about the cross and anticipating the resurrection, but God's not done yet. And I talk about the ascension all the time, but that's just well, yeah, it's because you're an axe guy, <laughs> and because I'm a little odd, yeah, yeah, an axe guy. Thanks, you're, you're an axe guy, yeah. Keep but. the emphasis on the right um, consonants. What's that, Joy? The emphasis on the right consonants when you say that word. Oh, the axe. Oh, Joy's only got Joy only has so Joy only has so many words. <laughs> left to be able to speak today. You can't waste them, Caroline. Don't ask her to repeat herself. Sorry about that. <laughs> Especially when he wasn't that funny in the first place. Do you have enough to talk about uh, snakes in the wilderness? Well, the question, <laughs> apparently not. The question this would be a good I always, time to fake a coughing fit. It, it would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. I might even do that. No, if I cough now, I'm going to feel really bad. Um. I I like to read this in terms of the people sought God and God respond responded favorably um because as I like to notice throughout scripture the people of God in the old and the new testament have fallen short of what God has asked of humanity and every time the people call cry out to God God responds faithfully. 
And here, once again, you know, they've talked against God. They've talked against Moses. And um, I don't know at what point or another is God's reminder of who's God not good news. Mm. I mean, there are times when I want to know that uh, God isn't going to just be at my beck and call because sometimes what I would ask for is not good for me or more importantly, may not be good for my neighbor. And this can be read among texts that remind us that God will say enough, but when we um, repent, when we cry out to God, God will stay the hand of the consequences of our lack of trust or lack of obedience. Anything? We, do, you, do you have something to say about that, Matt? Did you want to talk about snakes more? I would just say that's how I would uh, talk about it if I was preaching. I would I would not read the Numbers 21 text out loud, and I would just say, just so you know, there's this passage in Numbers, and I would say what Joy said, and then I would move on. Um, I don't know if I'm freaked out more by the passage or by Beth Tanner's commentary, because I thought Beth would make, make, it, make me feel better, and then she said these could be fiery snakes. <laughs> that's exciting. Yes. Thanks, Beth, for yeah. helping me sleep tonight. And then she's pointed out that it's also implied that the snakes remain an ongoing threat. That <laughs> I know. <laughs> I told you, I, I, Renita Weems taught me this. I take Genesis literally. I'm a girl. I don't do snakes. It's all the <laughs> way in Genesis 3. <laughs> well, and, yeah, especially and potentially one. scorpions, too. <laughs> yes. Ah. If you add scarabs, then that's it. I'm done. I'm I'm I've watched enough of the mummy movies to know that you don't want to meet up with the scarab. Why are we are going things? here? Okay. Sorry, what was I gonna say? I was gonna say that I mean there's the, the detail of God sent the snake sounds a little terrifying, but the um there there is for me in this passage a kind of acknowledgement of the wildness of nature. Yeah. Which we see, you know, in some of the Psalms that talk about these horrific storms that somehow proclaim the glory of God. Um, we see in the divine speeches at the end of Job, where God's like, <laughs> it's a wild world. You think you really understand it all? Uh, that that there is something about the the fragility of nature, but also the danger of the natural world that's part of our existence. And I'm not saying God designed it that way because God likes horror movies, but I'm saying that that we encounter God in the midst of a world that is not all about lions and lambs lying down together, um, because, but is a world that's dangerous. Because we encounter, all of our encounter is post-Genesis 3. All of our encounter is post-fall. But there's a hint in the fact that the woman could converse with the serpent that says serpents weren't always bad, weren't <laughs> always scary. I mean, you know, there, there's a hint at the possibility of a pre-fall reality. I don't know. But <laughs> my only experience is post-fall, so I don't do snakes. Exactly. Although these snakes and numbers were talking, that would also send me over the edge. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to uh, uh, point us to the psalm. <laughs> I'm not. I'm uh, transition. 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 I'm going to transi transition us to the psalm. But in part, I was thinking of the psalm, too, Matt, when you were talking about the the realities of the of of the world right and and that's really what the psalmist is is speaking about of the capacity to praise god and you know what you've talked about joy you talking about too about trusting god that uh that there's the possibility of of praise 
in the darkness, gloom, and prison, and sin, and illness, and hunger, and 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 as our colleague Rolf Jacobson talks about, and I would point people to his commentary on the website because it was really helpful in actually speaking into some of the themes that we've been talking about with with God's steadfastness, and uh, and so how is it that again some of the language of the psalms and we the psalm and we can talk about this but how some of the language of the psalm gives us uh opportunity to to speak about that steadfastness of god and um and that and to what extent we we see that in all of these texts um yeah, so and the, one way to use the, the language psalm. and the language of this psalm um in verse 17 some were sick whatever that uh, can be, through their ways, because of their iniquities endured affliction. Um, when we think of numbers, uh, there's a, th yes, there's a consequence of living in a fallen world, and God doesn't always protect us from the realities that are out there. And I like to think that's because God doesn't always make us do what God would prefer us to do. And with freedom, there are consequences. But what this tells us about the character of God, which is life for us, to know that God's steadfast love endures, and it endures forever.